I love carp fishing, I'm just absolutely addicted to it. So I do like all types of disciplines. I like fishing off the surface, I like fishing matches. Well, I used to like fishing matches, I'm not really that keen on them these days. And I like to do every kind of fishing, English fishing, overseas fishing, fishing for doubles, rivers, canals. I've always tried to sort of do every single thing because I think if you're gonna work in the trade as a, should we call it, professional carp angler then you can only give an opinion on your own fishing and if you've only fished one type of lake then to me it's not really you know a, a good representation of somebody that's been around the block a bit so I, i've kind of tried to sort of have a go at everything and although i've always liked big fish and i think everybody all carp anglers love big fish it probably was around about 2000 2001 when i started to specifically target big fish and I'd, I lived in Yorkshire at the time right up north and obviously in those days well in those days I should say carp fishing was about catching the biggest fish it was all about big fish hunting and all the big fish in the UK in those days was down south and I attempted to target some fish down south but they were all three or four hours drive away and every time I got to the lake the local anglers was just in the swims all the odds were stacked against me. So I decided at the time I was gonna have a, a little go close to home and start fishing some of the Yorkshire waters. And I started on a venue called Tylery, which is a really historical lake in Yorkshire. And some carping out for mid thirties at the time, really old lake, carp had been in the water for 20, 30 years, seeing everything over the years, very difficult to catch, very much of a demanding water as well. Long walk to the lake, about a mile trek and Lots of weed to contend with, lots of depth, 25, 30 acres I think at the time. It's a little bit smaller now because they've been backfilling it a little bit, but very much a, a difficult water, a demanding water. So the odds were against me, even though it was local, but being local water, I could start targeting it regularly and I really enjoyed it. And I started catching some of the fish in there. And when you target big fish and you eventually catch them, it's very rewarding. And I kind of got a little bit addicted to it in those days and since then I've gone on to fish lots of different waters in, in Yorkshire and obviously from further afield as well, you know, overseas, targeted, targeted some big fish overseas, targeted fish in different areas of the UK as well because I just became very much enjoyed it really, just became in, in, engrossed in it and even to this day it's, it's still, although I like doing all, all disciplines of fishing even today, it's catching those big fish that I really get the, the buzz from, you know, putting the effort in and then sitting there thinking god am i ever going to catch this fish and then eventually when you do catch it all of that hard work and effort that you've gone into to, to, to planning its downfall it comes to a proper magical moment i'd say it was a gradual thing because i've caught fish since 1980 that was when i caught my first ever carp so what's that that's 40 40 two years ago now so it's a long time ago and obviously I wasn't born overnight as being a, a big fish angler but being just an angler in those days the lure of the big fish was always tempting you wanted to catch the biggest on every lake you went to but I kind of made my name within the trade for fishing lots of different waters going to lots of different venues back in the 1990s myself and Rob Hughes started writing some articles in a magazine that was called Cart World early 1990s and back in those days carp fishing was about a lot of secrecy people wrote about big fish hunting but they never named the venues and as a young lad growing up reading the magazines I opened the magazines up and there was lots of nice inspiring fish but you didn't know where they were caught from because nobody in those days used to name anywhere so myself and Rob thought it'd be nice to go and write some articles on different waters that were open access day ticket waters and that's where I sort of got my breakthrough to, to get into, into the industry and it went from there and probably for about 10 years, 15 years, that's all myself and Rob Hughes did, is fish lots of different waters on a weekly, monthly basis. And we got known as being sort of day ticket anglers. And in those days, matches for carp fishing were a new thing. And we progressed into those, fishing different matches. We ended up winning a, a, a tournament that was called the World Carp Cup in 1996. And that was really just down to that day ticket approach, that short session fishing, which was totally unheard of in those days because it was all about big fish hunting. And of course I liked catching the big fish and every now and again, I did catch big fish, 
just from waters that I didn't really target and didn't specifically target. But I kind of progressed into the big fish hunting through, as I said, early 2000s, about 2000, 2001. I was married with kids. My kids uh, were very young and I decided I'd start targeting some big fish down south and as is always the case with a young family, it didn't work out for me because you, you get into those arguments with your missus about you being away a lot, travelling a lot as well, it, it just didn't fit into my lifestyle so that's where I ended up fishing more in Yorkshire and ever since then I've, I've fished loads of different waters in Yorkshire, targeted lots of different fish in Yorkshire and, and of course some really historical fish from Yorkshire and I think the, the carp fishing scene seen in those days was all about down south and all of the historic fish were down south and I kind of got a little bit bored with reading about the, the fish from down south because it was a bit of an overkill talking about the same venues, the same fish, just somebody else holding it and I wanted to start targeting fish close to home and trying to put those on the map as well a little bit and there are indeed some really magical and historical fish up north in Yorkshire, in Cumbria, in the Midlands and it's not all about down south, it's all about fishing wherever you choose to fish and I've, I'm nowadays I'm fishing, today I'm fishing on the water down in Reading, like fishing on a venue like this, just like targeting big fish so I'd say it's a progression, I've, I've, I've kind, of, kind of gone full circle on, on the fishing front and uh, even to this day I still like just going carp fishing, although the big fish hunting is what I, I much prefer to do. The first fish that I targeted was from a, a lake called Leighton's Pool in Wolverhampton, uh, Codsall in Wolverhampton where I used to live and I wasn't a big fish angler in those days, I was just a carp angler, just put the rods out and just hoped to get a bite but in the space of about a week, I think it had been about 1988, I ended up catching the number three fish, the number two fish and the number one fish and the biggest fish in the lake which was a fish called Lumpy and it was 24-2 I think and as I say I, I wasn't a big fish angler, I didn't really know what I was doing, I was just putting the rods out and just hoping something come along and I got loads wrong in those days. I remember the day that I caught Lumpy from very close to the island and that day I'd cast into a tree, I'd hit, um, hit some lily pads as well, casting some lily pads, got snagged up on those, I even um, I think I, I've got a memory, I can't remember because it's so long ago, I've got a feeling that the head of the landing net fell off as well while I was landing one of those three fish. I think it was the, the, the number three fish which I caught from under these rhododendrons to the right hand side but it was in the space of about a week and very euphoric moment but also lots of comedy of errors happening as well as is always the case when you're a, a young lad. The biggest lesson I've learned to do with big carp hunting, God there's loads of them but I, I, I'd, I'd guess that the, the most important one is that every fish is different. You know, there's lots of people in carp fishing who, who give very generalised statements about fishing, saying that this rig's the best or this is the best bait and things like that. Well, bait and rigs are important, of course they are, to do with, with carp fishing, but it's more important that you understand the fish that you're targeting. They've all got their own personalities, just like dogs have, just like, like cats have, people have. Some, some fish are very confident, some are very greedy, some like to hang around with the pack, some like to hang back and are very much loners. So it's about understanding the, the personality of the fish that you're targeting and you know, more importantly the swims that they get caught from because you will find that some, some fish will generally get caught more from one area of the lake. Some will get caught at certain times of the day more than others. You know, I've got loads of examples in my fishing career of, of fish being very much uh, certain fish being very much morning feeders or night feeders. I think if you're an overnight angler obviously then there's no need, no point targeting a fish that tends to get caught during the day and over the years I've been an overnight angler when I used to work at Carp Talk and I remember one fish that I used to, um, to wanted to catch was called Arnie from Manton Old Lake in Lincolnshire and it was known for getting caught mostly in the day but being an overnight angler the odds were very much stacked against me so I had to do something a little bit outside of the box to try and catch that fish and eventually I did catch that fish but there's lots of lessons throughout my career that I've learned but I think the most important one is that you need to understand the fish that you're targeting and it's, it's so so important and there's so many people that overlook it as well but um, 
that's the one thing I'd say to anybody is if you want to target a big fish then get to know that fish, get to know as much historical catch data about it as you possibly can because it's always going to be uh, of, of massive use to you. This would have to be, to keep it simple, and that was from Rod Hutchinson many years ago. Rod was a very simple carp angler, proper legend of the sport, pioneered lots of different venues, pioneered the bait and tackle industry, and he always said to me that carp fishing only ever got difficult when the industry got involved, because when the industry gets involved, you get a lot of people who, I've got this new idea, I've got this new rig, I've got this new bait, I've got this new, and yeah, it looks good on camera, it looks good on, social media gets your clicks and things like that, but does it actually catch you any more fish? And only a couple of days ago, I got a message off somebody saying to me, I watch a lot of your vlogs and all you do is talk about the same rig and it's boring. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's how I go about catching fish. I, I, it's not about being entertaining when it comes to rigs. It's about putting on camera what you actually use to catch fish. And I use the same rig wherever I go. I do. I've, when I used to be editor of magazines in the past, I used to get these articles from people and they was all talking about new ideas to do with rigs and bait and tackle. And yeah, they're great. But to me, the great side of it is that if every little bit of information you read gives somebody a little bit more confidence to go fishing, then that is the key element. It's about being confident in what you're doing. There is no wonder rig that's out there. There is no wonder bait. It's about using everything that you know about picking the best things that gives you the confidence to go fishing. And over the years, the more experienced you get at carp fishing, the more you realise how if you stay confident in what you're doing and keep things simple, it will always help you in the long run. So the point I'm getting at is don't overcomplicate your carp fishing. That is such an important part of it. I, I do, do loads of research. The, you know, when you're on the bank a lot, you get your phone out, you start scrolling through all sorts of things. So I, I do do lots of research. I, I get all the magazines sent to me as well. I still look through the old mags, looking at fish pictures. It's, information is so important. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that I've got in my head is I've been around carp in a long time, so I know a lot of different waters, I know a lot of lakes. My networking's pretty good and you can always know someone who knows someone who knows someone who can give you some information on a lake. So the more experienced you are at carp fishing, it definitely, definitely helps you. So my research, it starts from day one and I'm still researching this lake that I'm fishing today. I'm always looking for information, looking for when people are getting their fish, what time they're baiting up. It all helps at the end of the day. I don't make lists. I'm not a very organised person with regards to lists. That's a bit of an, an old fashioned thing. Um, but I do keep an eye on lakes. I do note fish. I've, I've, I'm fortunate that I've got a very photographic memory and that if I see a fish that I like, I, I keep a picture of it in my mind and I kind of know then where it's from, do as much research as I can. So I don't keep a list as such, but I've got fish in my mind that I'm always thinking, can I get a a ticket for that lake and working towards getting tickets for those lakes and it's a little bit like pre-baiting the lake really is that you it doesn't come overnight sometimes you've got to work towards getting a ticket you've got to wait for tickets and if it needs me to go to a lake and visit the owner have a, have a meeting with them I'll do that if it means putting a deposit down on a lake I'll do that you know it all depends on how much I want a ticket so I'm always working towards the end result is there something you can do to single out that big and well definitely there are and i think i've done it this year with girton in that when i joined girton i knew it was a very busy lake lots of anglers on there and it's 70 acres in size and there's over a thousand carp in there you know every year it's been getting flooded from the the trent and the cove lake it's been added to the number of fish that's in there cove has up, up until this year they've, they've put a fence around cove now but when the water levels come up, the co-fish have gone into the main lake, which is just added to the stock. It's not ruining the fishery, because the fish are getting bigger, it's gonna end up being a, a Grenville sooner or later, is, is Girton, because those, those stock fish are, are packing on waste. But when there's a carp in there that's over 60 pounds, and there's a thousand other carp in there that are nowhere near that weight, there's lots of different things. It's all about the percentage game when it comes to targeting big fish, is putting the odds in your favour. There is no one thing that will help you single out that biggest fish, other than if you saw it and you dropped a hook bait right on its nose. 
when you're static fishing, you've got to put the odds in your favour. And there's lots of different things that I've learned throughout my career, and I'll, and I'll try and talk about these individually now. Bait. If you want to get lots of bites from a lake, then use something bright, yellow, fruity, like a pineapple or a PB waft or something like that. Those kind of bright, fruity type flavours are very instantly attractive, so they're good at getting your bites. If you want to catch a bigger fish, then generally speaking, bigger fish love fish meals. So fish meal baits are going to give you a, a good chance of catching those bigger fish. When it comes to the size of the baits, using bigger baits is always going to give you a better chance of catching bigger fish. Whereas using smaller baits, obviously all different sizes of fish can pick them up. So you're trying to increase your odds of getting those bigger fish. Certain swims, certain areas of a lake, where do fish tend to get caught from? Target those areas. You know, the best example I can give you is on the Orient in France, which is 6,000 acres, and I've talked about this quite a lot. There used to be a fish in there called a bulldozer, and it was a 70 pound common, but it only ever got caught from one area of the lake, which was Gerardo Bay. Now, Gerardo Bay is about 100 acres in size, so if you wanted to target that fish, there was no point fishing 5,900 acres of the lake. It never got caught from anywhere else other than Gerardo Bay. And the same happens on lots of different waters. You'll find that certain fish will prefer certain areas. And then you can look at the stock of the fish as well, the age class of the fish. Younger fish live a completely different life to the older fish, very much the same way that humans do, and dogs, cats, cattle, everything, they're all different. And generally speaking, the older fish will try and keep away from those younger fish. They'll always, not always, but they'll, they're more likely to be on their own. So where you're seeing a lot of the stock fish showing, then the chances are you're not gonna catch those bigger fish amongst those big shoals of fish, unless it came to sort of spawning time when they start to congregate together. And Girton's a great example of that, in that butted the biggest fish in there, it tended to get caught away from the pack fish. It tended to, to live its life away from the pack fish. Most of the people that's ever caught it have caught it alongside one or two fish, whereas the people that are fishing amongst the pack fish, they're getting big hits of fish, 10, 15 fish a day. And obviously, you can, you can put your, your rods in your favour by staying away from the areas where those shoal fish are topping. And on Girton, I found an area in the middle of the lake, which was very deep, very much open water, not many features, not many snags, not many weed beds and stuff like that. It was an area where the biggest fish in the lake, I thought, could escape those other fish and be on their own and just live a normal life. And I managed to single out the biggest fish in there this year. Weighed 64 pounds. It was the only bite I got during a, a five night session. And to give you a little bit more of an insight into that fish and that lake, that particular swim had only done three bites in about three or four weeks. And you're talking about a lake that's got a lot of 20 pounders in it, a lot of 30 pounders in it, a lot of doubles in it. And those three fish that got caught from that swim were 41 pounds, 46 pounds and 64 pounds. So is it possible to single out the biggest fish from a very busy lake? It, it certainly is. There's certainly things you can do to increase your chances. It's not gonna stop you from catching the smaller fish, but as I said at the start, it's about the odds, putting the odds in your favor. What's the biggest fallacy in carp fishing when it comes to big fish? God, how long have we got? <laughs> um, I hear lots of different things about big carp fishing that I do sit there and scratch my head. I think the one that makes me scratch my head the most is the moon phase thing because I hear lots of people turning around and saying so and so caught a big fish on a certain moon phase and I go okay what's the evidence then? Well that fish only ever gets caught on a certain moon phase. I've, I've never seen any evidence that a particular fish only ever gets caught on a certain moon phase. I think Sometimes carp anglers can, can overcomplicate things, but um, the moon phase thing, I, I'm very much a, an open-minded person. I've listened to lots of the theory to do with it, and all I ever hear is uh, this fish only gets caught on a certain moon phase, and then lo and behold, the next capture of it, it's not on that moon phase. I've never seen any evidence whatsoever that says that certain carp only get caught on certain moon phases. The moon phase theory, 
I kind of understand when it comes to barbel fishing, and I know a lot of barbel anglers use it in that most of the time people are catching barbel in rivers, and the tides of the sea are definitely influenced by the moon phase. The tides of the sea are obviously connected to the rivers. The rivers are where the barbel are. Will there be an influence in how the barbel feed in the rivers down to the moon phase? Almost definitely, because there's a connection. But when it comes to a lake, where is the connection between a moon phase and the water that is in a lake? It might influence certain foods that's in the, the lake, but I've yet to see the evidence. Will it influence the fish? I've yet to see the evidence. We've done lots of research on this over the years as carp anglers as well. When I worked at Carp Talk, I remember Ben Wales coming to, who now works at Tracker, Ben does. He, I remember him coming to Carp Talk and we got onto this subject of moon phases and I said to him, get hold of all of the catch data, because we have, used to keep all the catch data to do every single capture that was sent into Carp Talk and go through the last two or three years, I can't remember how long it was, catch data and, and pinpoint the dates that certain fish were getting caught on, on certain moon phases. And Ben went through all of this data and he looked at it all and he basically turned around and said there was just no correlation whatsoever to do with moon phases and big fish. But the one piece of information that he did find some kind of correlation with big fish was that the best day to catch big fish was on a Saturday. Obviously because fish just topped in the swim, obviously because most people go fishing on a Saturday. So, <laughs> yeah, this is the simplicity of carp fishing. And it's a little bit like this subject of hormones at the moment. I keep hearing people turning around saying, oh, he's using hormones. And the reason he's catching fish is because of the hormones. I, I just can't see how it works. I, I really can't, you know, hormones influence fish into spawning and they don't influence him into, into feeding. Yet some people will make you believe that these good carp anglers that are out there, like some of the, I'm not gonna mention their names, but because they've been in, in associated with this subject, they're just good carp anglers. They're just amazing carp anglers. They're not using anything like hormones to influence the fish into picking baits up. It's just nonsense. Show me the evidence. There's no evidence there whatsoever. It's just the carp fishing grapevine doing its usual nonsense from time to time. Sometimes there's a lot of good stuff that's on the grapevine. There really is. And having been around the carp fishing grapevine for many, many years, and having been at the, the hub of it when we did carp talk for 24 years, so much of it is just nonsense. And I'm not saying that moon phases is nonsense. I'm still open to the, 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 the subject. Show me the evidence, I've yet to see any and I've yet to see anything to do with hormones either, other than he's using hormones because he's just caught 20 fish today. That's <laughs> nonsense, nonsense. Show me the evidence, guys. The Bishop from Redmere creates his record fish, basically, that he caught in 1980. It's a 50 pound linear from Redmere, back in the days when very few people carp fished on there. Imagine turning up to Redmere, seeing all that weed, seeing all of those big fish that were around in them days, the 1980s, and one of them was 50 pound. I can't think of anything better. What an amazing, amazing fish that was, the Bishop. It was a carp that I saw in Angling Times as a young lad that made me go, wow. And even to this day, when I see pictures of Chris Yates holding it 40 odd years ago, I still go, wow. Amazing fish, but there's lots, there's lots of big fish over the years that's made me go wow. Mary from Raysbury, um, Terry's former record fish. I, I was fortunate to, to fish Raysbury when Mary was still in there, after Terry had fished for it. I think back 1998, I had a ticket on there and saw Mary close up, saw it swim under my boat. I've got a great memory of it swimming under my boat and in crystal clear water, absolutely magnificent fish. And also uh, a fish in Germany, called Mary again which was a massive common it topped out about 94 pounds that fish did and a common of 94 pounds in a lake like that particular lake where it lives or it used to live because it's now passed I've got, I've got a ticket on that lake and it's gin clear water just like an English carp lake very very tricky water very tricky fishing and a 94 pounder a 94 pound common as well in that kind of environment proper wow factor for me.
Yeah, there's, there's massive differences between fishing overseas and fishing in England. First and foremost, it's down to the gear that you're using. You know, you tend to use a lot stronger gear overseas, a lot bigger leads, a lot bigger hook links and hooks and stuff. I mean, I go to Rainbow Lake in France and I use 12 ounce leads. Imagine using a 12 ounce lead in England. Imagine if somebody in England found out that I'd use a 12 ounce lead. Can you imagine the controversy there? <laughs> God, he used 12 ounce, he caught that fish, he used 12 ounce lead. He killed that carp because he was using a 12 ounce lead. You know, you go to Rainbow and some swims you go and you, you, you drop your leads out and you don't donk them down. You, you ting, ting, ting them down. There's that many leads on the bottom. So uh, that would be very controversial, I, I'd, I'd say, if you fished a 12 ounce lead in England. But yeah, you use, you'll use a lot stronger gear overseas. You know, you use, sometimes you use 50 pound braid or 50 pound mono. And again, if you use that in England, people would be crucifying you for, for fishing like that. It's brutal, it's that. But you go to a place like Rainbow Lake, I've never seen any carp with any untoward bad damage caused by angling. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's just a different environment. And when you're fishing a different environment, it needs different gear. You can't go to Rainbow and use 15 pound line and size 10 hooks. You'd have no chance of, of catching anything really other than rud but uh, there is a difference between fishing in England and overseas because generally speaking, our lakes don't have two brutal uh, snags and two brutal weed. You use 15 pound line straight through. This is a very weedy lake that we're at today. There's top to bottom weed in lots of places on here, but 15 pound line and 50 pound hook links, you can get them through okay. Hmm, epiphany moment in carp fishing where your results escalated. I think that's more down to timing than anything. Timing it right, being at the lake when when the fish are having it. You know, there's a few times in my fishing career when I've done that, gone to a lake and they're having it and I've had a big hit of fish, but uh, end up catching the biggest fish. Epiphany moments have definitely happened where you, you're putting in so much effort to catch a big fish and it's a right slog and nothing's going right for you and it's a head banger and that is the one thing i think most big fish anglers need more than anything is that refusal to give up you just got to keep going until you get the end result and i've had a few of those over the years where when i've eventually caught the biggest fish having put a lot of effort in for it and it's happened it's a proper proper magical moment it really is and um, even to this day I've, I've caught carp over 86 pounds is my biggest fish but the, the one fish that stands out the most in my mind is is a, a Yorkshire carp known as a nostril fish which was from Nostril Priory 2009 days only water and 50 mile drive from the house to the lake I was working at carp talk in the day as well and it's a days only water but I decided to go and target it because it's one of those carp in Yorkshire that had a real special tag attached to it. Didn't get caught very often. The lake itself, 20 acres in size, old silty mere, very, very low stock, less than 20 carp in there, 15 carp, something like that. And this fish was, was a 40. And I decided to target it. And the first day I walked on the lake, I was like, God, this is going to be hard. But the first day I walked on the lake, I caught one of them, which was just virtually unheard of. But that one fish gave me the buzz to keep going. And yeah, I can catch the big one in here if I, if I keep going. But being 50 miles away, I wasn't in tune with the lake, but I had to commit some efforts to go in there, like going on a regular basis, which was a big old drive, especially when you're working in an office during the day and you can only be on the lake during the hours of daylight. But carp fishing gets very addictive and I got properly addicted with that fish and I put some serious effort into it. Didn't fish there in the winter, no point being there in the winter. Didn't fish there in the autumn, no real point being there then either because the lake was just choked with weed. It was like a, a football field. But during, the, uh, during the, the spring and the summer, I, I put some effort in for it. And when I eventually caught it, I think it was April 15th, 2009, I'd been fishing another lake that night. I've been on willows during the day, during the, the night, I should say. 
and it was raining and I was down the bottom end of Willows and in those days you couldn't drive further than the main gate, you had to bury your gear down to the, to the end swims. But I was on fish, I'd caught some fish, it was teaming it down and the alarm went at about four o'clock in the morning to tell me to get up and I had those negative doubts, saying, stay in the bed, it's nice and warm, get up. You're not going to catch that fish unless you get up. And I remember packing the gear away in the, in the rain, barring it past a few of the lads who all said I was a nut job doing what I was doing. And I got to the, the gate at Nostal and I looked down and it just stopped raining. And there was no one on the lake at that time. Got, got there, barred the gear down. And the, the rule on Nostal was that you, if you couldn't find the fish, you, you just set up in the deepest area of the lake because they were hard to find a fish on there. There's so few of them in there. And if you couldn't see them, then you fished at the, the dam end, which was the deepest. And I'd already been to the lake to check it out the day before. And I couldn't find anything. So I went to the deepest end of the lake and started putting me, me, me brolly back up because it was soaking wet from having fished the night. And I wanted it up, not necessarily to just claim me swim, but to dry it out from the, the rain overnight. And I was putting the last peg in and I just happened to look up at the towards the middle area of the lake and I saw this big fish roll and I was like wow not only did you not see many fish roll on Nostal the fish I'd seen was a big one so I, I packed up straight away I'd not got the rods out but I packed all the gear up straight away got on the barra raced to that swim and set up and I was I'd had a fish that morning which was a recapture I'd had it three times that particular fish the small linear and I thought my chance had gone and I was looking at my watch, it was about 11 o'clock, half past 11, something like that. And I was getting ready to go to work because I had to get to work in, in the office. And fortunately, I had flexi hours. So as long as I did my job and got the work done, that's all that mattered. And most of the fish on, on Nostal tend to get caught in the, in the mornings, even though you could catch them at any time of the day, but it's mostly in the mornings. So I had this sort of rule that I'd pack up about one o'clock, go to work in the office, do my work and then go back to the lake and see if I could find a fish. A lot of effort, but I was just getting ready to pack up and the middle rod just had this drop back that just hit the floor. And there's lots of bream in Nostal, but very, very few carp. And I remember thinking it's a bream. And I just slowly, steadily walked to the rod and then I picked the rod up and tightened it up. And all, all out next was the rod just, just straight down. I'll never forget, it was such a fight, it was unbelievable just almost pulled out my hand, the rod was, and then the next minute the line and it just went and went and went and went, honestly, 30 yards, 40 yards, 50 yards, and eventually the fish stopped. And I'd had quite a lot of fish out of Nostal, and they were all old, ancient things, and none of them had fought like that at all. They'd all just come in like wet sacks because they were that old. But this one, I, I knew in my head was going, this is the big one, this is the big one. And then, 50, 60 yards out from where it picked up the bait, I just heard this almighty slap on the surface. And, and I was thinking, God, what can this be? You know, it just didn't stop, but then it did stop. And it just went round in an arc ever, ever so slowly. And I had these kind of thoughts in my mind, is there a catfish in here? Or is there a fish in here that nobody really talks about? But I knew in my, in my mind that it was the big one. And when I saw it in front of the net, and I saw its big scale on the shoulder and I eventually netted it. I, I cannot tell you how much emotion came through um, me at that moment. I probably, I, I don't think it did anything, I just stopped and looked at the fish. But everything sort of slowly went from the amount of effort that I put in, the thoughts of, am I ever going to catch this fish? And eventually there it was in front of me. I could touch it, I could see it i was eventually going to get my pictures with it it was such an amazing moment amazing moment and even to this day it still ranks as my favorite favorite ever carp because i put so much effort in the miles that i'd driven the hours that i'd spent walking the lake the hours i'd spent in the car driving to that lake because sometimes i was going there twice a day to try and find the fish uh, to, to get back the next day to have an idea where they were going to be and it was just a magical fish. Even, even to this day now, 2009 I caught it. I've caught a lot of mega carp since then. Eric's Common, the Wood Common, uh, Kitch, 4x4 from Nash's. Lo loads of really amazing carp, but that one still is, is the one that stands out 
not only because it's from Yorkshire where I live, but for the amount of effort that I put in to catch it. And it was a difficult fish and a very historical fish as well. So what's the most significant thing I've noticed when watching carp feeding and how has it influenced me angling? Well, the problem with watching carp feed, uh, carp is that when I see them, I want to catch them, especially if they're feeding. But um, I suppose watching car carp up close on places like Orchid Lakes, which I've done an awful lot of, has, has really opened my eyes into how each fish is different in that they not just got their own personalities like I talked about before, that some fish are more confident than others, but some fish feed in a completely different way to others. Some upend, some don't. You know, you can relate this to the, the shape of the fish. The more rounded and fat the fish is, the more it has to upend. The long, slender type fish don't tend to upend. I only watched a video the other day, I think it was on one of the, um, the other tackle company channels where they got some fish feeding up close and this one fish was feeding on particles. No, actually, it was a Steve Renyard. Steve Renyard put something on his um, Instagram of some fish feeding on particles at Bluebell and they just weren't moving at all. They were just literally very low to the ground, these fish were, and they were just slowly hoovering up the bait. They weren't upending, they weren't moving, they weren't aggressive, they were just very, very casually moving along. And if you're targeting fish like that, then it makes sense in my mind to use a very short hook link. So I, I kind of think that get to know your fish, get to know what you're targeting. If you're targeting fish that are very rounded and upend when they feed, then obviously you need a different length of hook link to one that's very slender. And generally speaking, a lot of lakes have got the same source of stock in them. They're all either simos or dinks, or of course you come across lakes where they're not, you've got a cross section of different fish. But if you're trying to target a particular fish with a different, a, t a certain type of body conformation, then you can certainly match the length of the hook link towards those fish. So that was something that significantly opened my mind. And even to this day, if I'm targeting a really rounded fish, then I will go for a more longer hook link. And if I'm targeting a fish that's a lot more slender, then I'll, I'll generally use a, a much shorter hook link. Do big fish baits exist? When I was a young man getting into the industry, I remember being in the office. You guys won't even know these blokes, unless you're my age. I was in the office with Kevin Clifford, this is Carp Talk office, Kevin Clifford, Tim Paisley and Rod Hutchinson. And we was talking about big fish baits. And I said, you're having a laugh, big fish baits don't exist. And all three of them just laughed at me. And then they went on to explain to me exactly how big fish baits work. And since then, I know full well that when I was a young lad, I was wrong because big fish baits definitely exist. And over the years of having worked at Carp Talk, and I keep going on about Carp Talk, but there was significant years in my life because I worked there for 24 years. And over the years that I worked at Carp Talk, I saw how certain big fish baits came onto the scene and literally just emptied venues where the carp were so hard to catch. So the point I'm getting at here is I'll, I'll explain it in a minute, but if you see a new bait come on the scene that is producing big fish on a regular basis, my advice to you is to get on it straight away because if you get on it early, you can really reap the rewards from it. And this relates to the ingredients that's used in the bait. Now, the bait industry generally takes a lot of its ingredients from the confectionery industry, the food industry, the health industry, the fisheries industry, the farming industry. They use ingredients that are massively researched certainly in the health and well-being industry, the amount of money that goes into those industries now to try and promote health and well-being in all kind of, whether it's fish, animals for food and humans, those kind of ingredients are almost certainly going to have a benefit to the fish that you're fishing for. And obviously, bigger fish generally are older fish. They've been around a lot longer. Their taste preferences are completely different to younger fish. You can relate this to kittens and cats, calves and cows, puppies and dogs, children and adults. You know, we, you feed differently, your, your food preferences are different. As I'm, I'm getting older, I want something a lot stronger in my food. When I was a young kid, I hated curries. 
anything that was overly strong, I hated it. But as I've got older, my taste buds have changed. I've seen lots of food over the years. My, my taste buds have been beaten to pieces by red hot cups of tea and coffee and things like that. So I'm after something that's gonna stimulate me. So the stronger flavors, the stronger ingredients are gonna stimulate me a lot more. And if an ingredient has not been used before as well, and if you're a fish that's not been um, that's been around a long time, you've been caught in lots of different baits, something new that comes out, it stimulates you in a completely different way. So there's certain baits, there's certain ingredients that are in those baits that definitely influence the bigger fish. They're not going to only single out the bigger fish because carp at the end of the day are inquisitive and you can put a bait out there and one minute you catch a two pound carp and then the next minute you catch a, a 50 pound carp. That's how carp fishing is. But as I said, right at the beginning of this piece, when you're talking about big fish, you're trying to increase your odds all the time. So the point I'm getting at is, there are definitely some baits out there that will give you a better chance of catching fish. And I talked about using bright colored yellows and, and fruit flavored baits will give you a better chance of, of getting a bite. You know, you, you, you've got fish, young fish that pick up anything, whereas the big fish, they won't pick up anything. They'll a lot of the time they're shy, they're very careful about how they feed. Certainly they're hard to catch fish. So when I first joined DNA a few years ago, and I knew full well that SLK was a bait that had been doing a lot of big fish from up and down the country. When I was working at Carp Talk at the time, I'd seen how many big fish it, it produced. And when I joined DNA, the bait that I wanted to use was, was SLK. And over the time, during the time that I've worked for DNA, SLK has has come with some incredible fish. It's a, it's a bait that's got a track record for producing big fish. The ingredients that are in it are known for being big fish attractors. And the best example I can give you is when I caught the wood common from Spitfire Pool. That particular fish, it's known for being a very, very difficult fish to catch. It doesn't get caught very often at all. And when I arrived to the lake, it's a 50 pound common, 50, one of the best looking carp in England. And when I arrived to the lake, the guys who'd been on the lake previous to me had uh, put quite a bit of bait in and I found the wood common very close into a snag and right close to it is a big area of bait and when I saw it I thought oh my god how am I going to catch that fish when there's a load of bait down there that's not been eaten and I thought well I'm not going to put a great deal of bait out I'm just going to use a single up bait and I chose an SLK wafter I think at the time and I put it as close to where the wood common was without spooking it and the next morning I caught it. Now, why did it pick up that bait, but it left the other pile of bait? I don't know, but SLK has got a track record for producing lots of big fish from very hard to catch waters. Big fish rigs and big fish, do they exist? Um, is there a rig that will only catch a big fish? No. Is there a rig that will give you a better chance of catching bigger fish? Yes. I think when Terry, Hearn first brought out the stiff hinge rig, he proved that because he, he caught an awful lot of big fish on that rig. So there's definitely certain things about that rig that will give you a better chance with bigger fish. But I think it's mostly down to the components than anything because when you hook a big fish, you want to make sure you've got a good chance of getting it in. There's no point having a size 10 hook and a, a tiny hook link if you hook a big fish and you've got to give it a bit of pressure. So. The point I'm getting at here is that I'd rather fish with stronger gear, bigger hooks. If it sacrifices me getting a few bites, I know at least that when I do hook a big fish, I've got a better chance of catching it. And most of the lakes I go to, I'm never the top rod on them. I'm very, on here, I'm, I'm nowhere near the top rod. But I do know that eventually if I hook that big one on here, the way that I fish with strong hook links and good size hooks I've got a decent chance of getting it in so that's the most important thing I think when it comes to big fish is to use good strong tackle. Big fish and intimidation. Is it intimidating to fish? Have I ever been intimidated to fish a water? No I don't think I have. The carp at the end of the day they're catchable. You know some carp get caught more than others it's more down to how much time and effort you want to put into catching that fish and this goes back to what I said earlier on you know big big fish hunters big fish anglers 
you can't be labelled that if you, you only fish one lake. If you go to Eurowacker and just catch a, a world record fish, it doesn't instantly make you a big fish angler at all. And it's the same in England. If you go to a, a lake that's stuffed full of big fish and you, you catch some big fish from there, you're not necessarily a big fish angler. It's, it's big fish angling and big fish hunting is about mindset more than anything. And you've got to have that mindset to, to, to follow your goal through. Sometimes it takes you a few days, a few hours to catch a big fish. I've been on lakes last year. I, I caught the farriers beginning on my first night, but that didn't make me an expert on farriers. It makes me a jammy sod. And other lakes I've gone to, it's taken me years to catch a big fish. The nostal fish that I talked about before, when I caught the big in from Emmetland, big sea up there, a day ticket complex, a 42 pound common from Yorkshire. It took me years to catch it, and but but I didn't give up, and that's the, that's the biggest, I think, um, important part of what I'm trying to say here is that if if you're inclined to give up, then things have intimidated you. But if you never give up, then you've overcome all of those doubts that you get. Will I ever catch that fish? And very often I get those doubts when I go to lakes. God, am I ever going to catch this fish? And I actually remember. Um, Daryl Peck, great big fish angler, talking to me about when he caught two-tone from down in mid-Kent, when he sent his cash report through to Carp Talk. I remember him saying to me over the phone, he had those doubts where he was thinking, am I ever going to catch this fish? Because he just kept putting the time and effort in to catch it, but eventually he got rewarded. And it is that reward that you get at the end of it, that you, you put that effort in, you get those negative doubts, but clearly he wasn't intimidated though when he, he caught that fish because he carried on going and you've got to carry on going. You're not going to get big fish overnight. You might get it once or twice in your career, but it don't happen all the time. And anybody who's successful at anything, it doesn't happen overnight. Ronnie O'Sullivan doesn't become world snooker champion by just getting up in the morning and going, oh, I'm going to go and shoot a 147. Or, Mark Tyson in his day, or Tyson Fury nowadays, doesn't just get up in the morning and go, oh, I think I'm going to be heavyweight champion of the world. You've got to go and put the road work in, you've got to put the hours in, you've got to put the effort in. And it's the same with big fish hunting. You've got to put the time and effort in. And if anything is going to intimidate you, then you're not going to catch that fish. So the point I'm getting at here is, if you do feel a little bit intimidated, they're only carp at the end of the day. You're going to blank, you're going to blank. You're going to get times when you go to a lake and there's a bloke opposite you who's a bit aggressive, he's telling you to stop fishing in his swim. You've got to overcome these kind of things in, in, in all walks of life when you're on a lake. You've got to uh, put up with the fact that the day that you go fishing, it's not the right weather conditions. It's, it doesn't always happen instantly. And the world today is very instant and people want things instantly, but you're not going to get big fish instantly unless you're just lucky on, on occasion. We're not lucky all the time. Sometimes you've just got to put that effort in and you've got to overcome those doubts and keep following it through. The biggest mistake I've ever made whilst in pursuit of a certain fish is fishing for the motorway pond Biggin in Yorkshire when I'd heard rumours that it was dead and it more than likely was dead because it never got caught again. <laughs> but I've also fished lakes where people have told me that a fish is dead and I know it's not dead because I've seen it. But in the instance of the motorway pond fish, from a day I got a night book and started fishing it regularly to the day when I concluded that it was more than likely dead was about three years. And during that time, the fish had been caught about a month after I got a night permit, one of the lads had caught it, and then it never got seen again. So, and that's not the, down to the guy who caught the fish, it's nothing to do with him, it went back okay. The fish just disappeared. And um, that's what happens sometimes with carp. But there was times when I was walking around that lake, I'd seen every other fish in the lake, but I'd not seen that one. So. I probably spent a year and a half, two years of my life fishing for a carp that weren't there. So that's a little bit of a regret that I've got. But, um, you know, that's just part and parcel of how it goes sometimes. You know, I, I, I fished on Nostal, which I talked about a few times, 
when there was loads of rumours circulating about that big and being dead, but I'd seen it, so I knew it was alive. So I knew a lot of the rumours to do with that fish were more than likely just put out there by guys trying to scare people off the lake or intimidate them off the lake. But I knew what I'd seen and I wanted to catch it and I went on and caught it. But the motorway pond fish, yeah, probably wasted a couple of years of my time fishing for a ghost, really, in that, in that instance. Yeah, but it's my PB, my UK PB now at 64. But it won't demotivate me from going carp fishing in England at all. Because weight to me nowadays is it's important, but it's not the be all and end all. I'm fishing for a carp today that's a, a lot smaller than butthead. The biggest this fish in here has been is 50 pound eight ounces. Butthead weighed 64 pounds. But I'm motivated to catch this fish in here because it's a beautiful lake to fish. It's a beautiful carp for, for starters, and it's a beautiful lake to fish. It's well run by Alan Cooper, and lakes can motivate me just as much as fish can. It's not just about weight anymore. And I think carp fishing nowadays, I think it's been proven that weight was massively important in the early days of, of the carp fishing um, industry developing in the 80s and 90s, 2000s, but it's kind of not, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's kind of gone in a different way nowadays. If a fish looks really nice, that can motivate you into catching it. It can be a lot smaller than maybe your biggest biggest carp. It can be an old fish. I caught a fish a few years ago that was over 50 years old, and it was nowhere near my personal best. It was 38 pounds, and at the time, my UK personal best was 56. But it was an old carp, and I really wanted to catch it because it was older than I was. So there's a little bit of um, a story about that fish and it's not just weight nowadays, it's about particular fish and what they do for you if they get you buzzing. I'm sure a lot of people get motivated by, by weight still today, but I see it on social media, you know, like, boom, boom, you know, I've just caught this bigger than, it's, it's great, it's whatever inspires you, whatever rocks your boat, but um, weight to me is not that important anymore. Uh, but that's not to say I wouldn't want to catch a, a 70 pound English common if one ever exists because of course I'd love to break my personal best again but I'm probably unlikely to because there aren't many 64 pound plus commons around in the UK there never has been there's only been one that's ever been bigger and that was um, a fish from the avenue uh, Burfield commons a very inspiring fish it's a lot smaller than um, the fish I've just caught but I don't don't really want to go and fish on Burfield so it's whatever inspires you, I think, more than anything. And um, but it inspired me to catch it. I've caught it. I now have to find somewhere else that inspires me. And at the moment, this lake inspires me. And I'm sure there'll be lots of other lakes in the future that'll inspire me after this one as well, because I'm just a carp angler and I just love catching fish. Which part of my angling career would I like to relive again? Well, I can split this into two. You can relive the good bits which I definitely would relive again because the, the buzz that I got from them, I'll come to that in a minute, but there's also the, the, the negative bits in that I'd like to go back and correct a few things. And one of the things I'd like to go back and correct that stands out in my mind was back in the days of when I used to fish on Lake Reduta, which is the old world record lake in Romania. And this would have been 1998. The lake was completely unknown. The stock was unknown. We were fishing for just myths and one of the guys had caught an 82 pounder, which was the world record, one of the Austrians that I knew. And every time you hooked a fish on there, you was battling the obstacles of snags, trees, graveyards, churches, all sorts of different things because it was a flooded valley. And you, you hook something and you've got a 50% chance of getting it in. And I did lose some big fish on there during my first few trips. One or two of them that I saw right close below the boat. But one memory I've got is of fishing in Church Bay, which is where the steeples were, where all the graveyards were, where all the dead bodies were around you and stuff like that. And I hooked into this fish and I knew straight away it was a big fish and it just plodded into the margins. And I got it to almost where Ollie the cameraman is, this fish. I could see its back sticking out of the water and it was 60 plus, maybe even 70 plus, I don't know, because I didn't catch it. But I saw it and I was just about to net it and the hook pulled. And how big that fish was, I've no idea. It was a common 
and that area was known for producing a particular fish which was the biggest common in the world at the time and Tim Paisley went on to catch it and it was a fish that weighed 71, 72 pounds when Tim caught it, I can't remember the exact weight, it was the big common in there and I would just love to have caught that fish because back in those days a 70 pound carp was just unheard of, there were so few of them around, it's not like the commercial lakes nowadays which are full of bait and the fish are just packing the weight on. These were completely natural fish where they'd never been caught before. They lived on natural food, massive swan mussels that were like this, a crayfish that was almost as big as your, your hands as well. And to catch a carp like that, a wild carp of that kind of size would have just been absolutely magical because the, the biggest fish that I caught out of Reduta was a 52 pounder. But to catch a 60 pounder out there would have been even miles better than that. And a 70 pounder would have been a complete dream fish. But, um, that's the one bit of angling that I'd like to go back to and relive again and, and change a few things because I'd love to have caught that fish and I'd have probably dived in with the landing net and, and scooped it up. It was that close to the net, but I don't know why I let it go away and go off on one more swim and then the hook, the hook pulled. But uh, if I could have dived on it with a landing net, I'd have had it. <laughs> but um, the one bit I'd like to relive from a pure magical moment is probably the World Carp Cup in 1996 which myself and Rob Hughes were fortunate enough to win. It was the first ever global carp match. It was when carp matches were first kicking off and I'd said earlier on about me, me and Rob making our names within the industry through the day ticket series that we'd done in Carp World where we'd fished lots of different venues and fishing lots of different venues gave both myself and Rob a massive insight into how carp fishing works and it instills that confidence into you to know that it's not just about this rigs and bait that the industry keeps pushing. It's about understanding carp and understanding how they live. And we entered that World Carp Cup knowing we'd fished lots of different waters. We had an idea that we'd, um, our approach to fishing would, would, would stand us in good stead. Because back in those days, fishing for bites just didn't exist. It was all about big fish hunting. So when this World Carp Cup came on the scene, Kevin Nash, who at the time was our sponsor, said to both myself and Rob, I'm going to en enter you into that event because I think your short session style of fishing will do you well. And we went on to catch the first fish, the most fish, the biggest fish and win the event. And that was having come out of the draw 30th because it was a watercraft draw where we still got our first choice of swim when we came out 30th. Just couldn't believe it. It's almost like it was scripted. It, 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 it was meant to happen. But the buzz that we got from winning that match, not only did it propel us into the industry and, and now I've been able to forge a career from it, but the buzz we got from winning it was just exceptional because I can't, I can't explain to you how many people went to that event and how high profile it was. It was just absolutely massive. There was 30, 40,000 spectators that went to it. And on a lot of occasions, myself and Rob, our swim was just surrounded by 20 people deep. There was hundreds of people around our swim because fishing is massive in France. It's absolutely huge and the owner had really promoted it because an event like that, a World Carp Cup event, World Carp Championships, it was just, it never happened. So this was, it was televised. It was sponsored by some of the biggest companies in the world, including Ferrari, believe it or not, Ferrari. That's, that year they only had two events that they sponsored. One was the the, the F1 championships, they put a team into that and they sponsored the World Carp Cup because the owner who organised it was one of their biggest customers and he persuaded them to, 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 to get involved. So there was a massive Ferrari show on, on, on display during the event and it just attracted tourists and people and that's why it was so popular. But uh, the buzz that we got from winning it was just amazing because there we were in the first ever World Carp Cup the national anthem had been played. We was called forwards as the winners of the World Cup Cup. And as two young lads hearing the national anthem play, hearing people applaud you, yeah, it was almost like we just won the Olympics. It was just unbelievably amazing. And the buzz that we got as two young lads on that podium, you know, giving it large and all that was just awesome because carp fishing in those days was all about big fish hunting, but on the continent, it was about match fishing and England was looked at as being the pioneers of carp fishing. And I think we did England proud in that event because there was anglers in there from all 
sorts of different nationalities, French, Germans, Spanish, Italians, all over the place. But the English had won it and we had a proper buzz about it. And I saw Rob only a couple of weeks ago and even to this day, we both reminisce about that moment. It was just unbelievable. And there's been, since then, there's been loads of different carp matches. And if anybody ever turns around to you and says that carp matches don't count and you shouldn't enter them and stuff like that, well, let me just say, if you, if you enter them and you go on to win them, not only do you get a nice paycheck out at the end of it from, from a lot of them nowadays because there's some good money knocking about, I can assure you you'll get an absolutely massive buzz which will live with you the rest of your life. And that one still gives me massive goosebumps today when I think about it. No, we didn't win a Ferrari. No, we won, we won a check and Nashi took half of it off us because he, cause he paid for our entry. So, but I don't, I don't begrudge him for that. But uh, yeah, good, good times. <laughs> So what motivates me to go fishing for big fish? It should be reworded to what motivates me to go fishing. And what motivates me to go fishing is that I think I was born to be an angler. I was just, I'd been addicted to it ever since I was a young kid. And my dad first introduced me to fishing when I was two, three, something like that. I can't even remember. But I've always fished and I kind of progressed into being a carp angler. And without trying to turn this negative in any way, I do think that my generation of carp anglers are completely different to this generation of carp anglers in that there was reason, the reasons you ended up being a carp angler when, from my generation is that you progressed into it. You, 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 you learned how to float fish for roach, tench, bream, sticklebacks or whatever. And then carp in those days were mythical fish that were uncatchable. But eventually, when you'd caught everything else, you wanted to go and have a go for the carp. And that addiction to fishing made you want to catch those carp, and it's still in me today. I, wherever I go, I, I, I walked the dog only the, the other day over some new area, and there was a bit of a flooded area, and I stopped and had a look in this flooded area over in Yorkshire, where I live. And lo and behold, it was nice and warm, and there was a carp sat there basking. It was only about three pounds. Somebody probably put it in from their local tank from the, the, the tank at home or whatever, and I wanted to catch it. It's, it's just in me, it's just part of me. It's not just about big fish, I just love catching fish. I went to Central Park a few years ago, went to run the marathon with the missus. Saw there was some carp in there when we was walking around. Straight away, I've got on the phone, Googled where there's a shop, went and bought a fishing rod, went and bought some sweet corn, and went and caught a fish, because I was just, got to go and catch one and great memory to, to catch it. It's most expensive sweet corn I've ever paid for though because that was in New York City Centre and it's, it was $8 I paid for this little tub of sweet corn and I didn't land it in the landing net either. I landed it in a plastic bag, that fish, because there wasn't any landing nets in the shop. I bought a rod, bought a reel and some hooks, put the sweet corn on, dropped it down, tied a, a stick because I've not got any floats, tied a stick on with a bit of grass and that was all I used just wanted to catch a fish and I've got that picture now of me in Central, Carp, in Central Park with a, um, a fish in my hands which was just wonderful because I just love going fishing and as I say I, my, my generation of carp anglers, my generation of anglers I should say, have slowly progressed into being carp anglers and, I, and I'm not knocking, knocking in this generation of anglers at all but there's a lot of people who've got into carp fishing instantly which is great, it's just different how things change but there are people, I think, nowadays in this generation that are into carp fishing for all the wrong reasons. They're in it maybe to get likes on Instagram or whatever, rather than to have that addiction for fishing. Because unless you've got that addiction for fishing, you won't hang around very long. You might catch some nice fish, you might do your Instagram page for a short while or whatever, but unless you've got that addiction to carp fishing, then it's not going to stay with you. And there are it's not a generational thing because there are young lads nowadays who, who are young, the new generation of anglers that's coming through, your Tom Makers, your Mark Bartlett's, they're out and out fishing machines. They're absolutely addicted to carp fishing in exactly the same way that my generation are. And there's lots of guys that like that, but there are also a lot of these newcomers that are in it for the wrong reasons, really. But uh, that's not to say that they're not welcome. They're all welcome in the fishing industry. That's one of the good things about angling is that doesn't matter who you give your rods to, somebody can go and have 
a few moments with those rods that can catch fish that will last a lifetime. You could give my rods to me nan and stick her on Euro Aqua. Uh, Aqua in Hungary and she could be the world record holder. And you can't do the same with golf clubs. You know, if you gave your golf clubs to Tiger Woods, if Di Tiger, Tiger Woods gave you your golf, his golf clubs, you're not going to win the Masters. It's, 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 angling's completely different and it's, it's open to all. Everybody's welcome in, into it. But um, the point I'm getting at is that with me, I'm just addicted to fishing, just addicted to carp fishing. And lots of people have got it. A lot of the guys that work in the industry, the guys that do the same kind of job to, to what I've got, they're all the same. They're, they're all completely addicted to fishing. They're completely addicted to carp fishing. And they've been anglers all their lives. And it is a wonderful sport. It allows you to make many great memories, meet lots of great people. And I just hope it keeps going like that for the future because angling's in a good place. It's England's full of massive carp. There's loads of carp that are available to everybody. And I hope I haven't come across in a negative way there towards what I've, ex I've explained to the two different generations because fishing today is different to how it was. And that was the point I'm trying to get at. Everybody's welcome in fishing. Everybody's got their own reasons for being in it. And it is a wonderful sport and I'm massively addicted to it. And I know there's lots of people out there that are exactly the same.